Kevin O'Brien, the director of the Institute of East Asian Studies, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome all of you, uh, especially our distinguished visitors from uh, Mongolia and the consulate, and the consulate to a conference on um, uh, revisiting Asia's democratic revolt. Uh, this is a conference that will be paying special attention uh, to Mongolia's democratization uh, in comparative perspective. Uh, this is about the I don't know, ninth or tenth event we've done on Mongolia this year. Uh, I think it's probably as many as we've done on many of our other countries uh, in East Asia. And it's part of IES's two-year-old uh, Mongolia initiative, uh, which has been generously funded by the Mongolian government uh, with a little bit of help from the U.S. Department of Education, help that Donald Trump, uh, notwithstanding, we hope will continue. Um, we here at Berkeley have had a long-term interest uh, in Mongolia. Uh, this is the place where uh, Mongolian language was first taught, taught in, in North America in the 1930s uh, and was taught up until 1995 and has been restored uh, in the last uh, year or two. Uh, I also just learned today that one of my colleagues, uh, Martin Shapiro at the law school, was instrumental in uh, helping uh, Mongolians come up with their constitution in 1992. So we have more recent connections uh, a as well. We'd like to thank again the Mongolian government for enabling us to start the, the Mongolian initiative and, and making it possible today to bring together uh, scholars, officials, um, representatives of NGOs such as the Asia Foundation and community members, uh, including members from the uh, Berkeley, uh, the Bay Area's large Mongolian population, uh, to learn about uh, topics uh, like Mongolian democracy. In these eight or ten events we've done this semester, they've, uh, this year, they've been on many very wide-ranging topics from Mongolian archaeology to uh, Mongolian environment to the um, Mongolian Empire, and, and now uh, we're coming into the present to look at Mongolian uh, democracy. Uh, as I said today, the topic is Mongolian democratization and political change uh, in the fraught and sometimes dangerous neighborhood uh, that Mongolia lives. Uh, Though East Asia has seen a wave of democratization uh, since about the time that it began in Mongolia, uh, Mongolia's two closest neighbors have notably not uh, taken part in that wave or at most in Russia's case, took only a few steps in that direction before retreating. So one of the big questions we're going to be asking today will be what can we learn from Mongolia's experiences looking at it comparatively and looking at a series of uprisings that took place around the same period of time. Uh, and in particular, what we can learn from Mongolia that could be useful as we go forward, uh, both politically and also in terms of scholarly attention to the question of the relationship between protest and political change. Uh, we're going to start today with Korea and the Gwangju uprising, then we're going to move on to China, uh, looking at both historical background uh, of protest and then on to a number of talks on the Mongolian democracy movement, uh, including Professor Badesky trying to do a comparison of a number of these uprisings. Um, as a student of protest in China myself, this is a topic very close to my heart, and I'll be very interested in learning and hearing about connections, explicit and tacit, uh, between these different movements, uh, something that I don't think is done too often, where we have people studying um, contemporaneous, but movements in different countries at the same time. Um, this will be part of our new effort as the Mongolian Initiative is moving into its second and third year to open up the study of Mongolia. We've done a lot of topics uh, some as small as looking at the Mongolian milk industry, some as large as looking at the Mongolian empire. But we're thinking that what we need to do now is to put Mongolian in a global Asia uh, context and to show those of us who study other places the benefits of learning from the Mongolian experience. I was just talking at lunch to people about Mongolian international relations and how much we can learn from how Mongolia has learned to live in its very uh, tricky neighborhood for thousands of years now. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, uh, the Consul General uh, from Mongolia, Consul General Saladin, uh, to give some introductory remarks uh, on, on behalf of the Mongolian government. Thank you. Consul General Saladin.
Good afternoon. It's my honor and pleasure to greet all of you here. And esteemed moderator, thank you for the given opportunity to make this welcoming remarks to this very important event, which is devoted to the commemoration of 25th anniversary of Mongolian new democratic constitution. Hereby I extend a special welcome to those distinguished uh, experts who uh, were invited uh, to this uh, meeting as the speakers of this meeting. And I should also express my highest appreciation to those who traveled a long distance uh, from Mongolia and also ca Canada uh, with a special purpose to attend this meeting. At this point, <coughs> I'd like to draw mm, my special attention to one of uh, the honored guests of this event. It is His Excellency MP Bolt, who has come from Mongolia this morning. And it is very remarkable because he was one of those 430 people's representatives at the Mongolian parliament 25 years ago when he took a part in drafting, formulating, debating, and adopting the Mongolia's democratic constitution. Thank you, Your Excellency, for coming here. He knows very details, and I believe he will share with you very absorbing stories about that time. Yeah? And <coughs> Mr. Bolt, having been is the leader of Mongolian student movement at that time, uh, witnessed how the Mongolian communist regime was collapsed and collapsed by the revolt of youth and students, and <coughs> how the democratic new government was established, and his witness of these processes in Mongolia at that time. The Constitution of Mongolia, adopted January 13, 1992, is part of the country's transition to democracy, is now over 25 years old. It was amended twice, first in 1999 and 2001. Mongolia is different today than it was in the early 90s. So current political debates focus around a small number of uh, potential amendments to this, to this constitution. For instance, two basic challenges stand out. First, the major constitutional issue of whether member of the parliaments can simultaneously uh, serve in government um, <coughs> has absorbed political attention since 1996 when a case at the Constitutional Court uh, required the separation of the government and the parliament. The second challenge has been the discovery of uh, minerals um, which have completely changed Mongolia's economic uh, structure and have challenged the governance system, the governance system at all. Yeah. I think <coughs> Honorable Bachimek, a former MP uh, who is also presenting here, uh, <clears throat> can give you more detailed explanations as to these points. Yeah. She's a professional politician of new generation, and she has a rich experience of having served as an advisor to the Mongolian National Security Council, and as well as the advisor to the President of Mongolia. She was a leading expert of Mongolian Institute for Strategic Studies. So I hope she will share with you her positions as to this point, too. Taking this opportunity, I am proud to note here that Mongolia as, as a state has a long tradition of legislative ruling. It is remarkable that eight centuries ago, Chinggis Khan decreed two laws, namely 
Ixasak, which means general governance, and Ixat, general uh, enforcement. These two laws, like a constitution, were upheld and abided by all the nations throughout the entire empire to maintain peace, justice, and discipline. In 1999, Washington Post, when defined Chinggis Khan as the man of the millennium, wrote, single man who had the greatest impact on the world history of the last thousand years, in that Chinggis Khan instituted a global order based on the free trade, good governance, and unification of international law. So today, we are guided by this new democratic constitution. Uh, Mongolia steps up side by side with other democratic nations towards securing the independence and sovereignty of states, cherishing human rights, freedom, and justice, contributing to the development of democratic society as its supreme objective. So, when closing my welcoming remarks, I want to extend my ultimate gratitude to the team of UC Berkeley's Institute of East Asian Studies, including Center for Korean Studies, Center for Chinese Studies, and as well, Mongolia Initiative, for the excellent arrangement of this event. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before we begin the presentations, I'd like to invite MP Boll to come forward for a moment uh, to say a few words. And I'd like to attest to his fortitude that I assume was steeled when he was a student protester uh, and was involved in the parliament. Uh, because I heard at lunch today that he was working in the Mongolian parliament until 2 o'clock in the morning this morning before he took a 23-hour flight to come here. So I think if nothing else, it proves you that if you start your life on the streets and you start your life working for political change uh, some 25 years later, uh, there will be benefits for your fortitude. And he tells me he's come to North America twice uh, in the last 10 days, uh, which is also above and beyond the call of duty. So please uh, come and uh, we'd love to hear a little from you before we'll hear his formal remarks later. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Brain. Uh, uh, in fact, it, it took me only one hour to get here. I started uh, my plane at 9 a.m., 14th of uh, April, on Friday. And I arrived here at 10 a.m., <laughs> uh, 14th April, on Friday. So it took me longer from airport to get here. You know? <laughs> But uh, I managed, and I'm really very happy to be here among real friends of Mongolia. And uh, always talking this topic about democracy, it's really it's, uh, your uh, lifetime uh, cherished issue. And uh, I am really glad to be here. And later I'll talk a little bit uh, extensively on, on, on the topic. And uh, right now, I wanted to use the opportunity and uh, thanking for for the leadership of uh, University of California Berkeley uh, taking Mongolian initiative uh, seriously and creating a uh, uh, very important center of Mongol studies. There are some books which I brought this morning. Thank, thank you very much. We'll add these proudly to our collection. Our first speaker uh, will be uh, Professor Nahum Lee of Asian Languages and Culture uh, at, from UCLA. Thank you so much for inviting me to this very important occasion to talk about democratic um, protest in three different countries, uh, the topic on which I have not had a pleasure of participating before, so this is a very unique opportunity for me. Um, so I, I just like to point out before I talk about the, the particular event called the Gwangju People's Uprising that took place from May 18th of 1980 to May 26th of 1980 um, uh, by pointing out that in some ways this was in the context of long struggle that South Koreans have waged 
um, since 1960, what you might call South Korea's repertoire of collective actions. And I'm limiting myself here to uh, post-1945s, and uh, so we can begin from 1960 students' revolt that basically toppled the authoritarian regime of Sung Man Lee to another momentous event uh, known as the June 3rd demonstration uh, that opposed the South Korean, um, South Korea and Japan normalization treaty. And it goes on and on, as you can see on this slide. Um, in fact, the 1960s student uprising was Asia's first people's power. Um, but at the same time, this was a, a revolution that the participants didn't know was happening. And so the April 19 student uprising was very much uh, a historical burden for people who came after. Uh, and many of the, of course, the participants of the democratization was burdened with this notion that in order to bring about real change in society that you need to be prepared. Uh, so this was considered unfinished revolution. In other words, the post-1960 generation had this notion that you really do need to bring about true revolution. This is the scene from the 1960, and then I talked about briefly the generation that was involved in the protest against the normalization treaty between South Korea and Japan. And from this moment on, you begin to see that there is a continuous demonstration, especially by the university students. Um, Again, the scenes from the 1965 uh, protest against the normalization treaty. As you can see, uh, we have students, we have um, uh, university professors, we have ordinary South Koreans uh, who are participating in demonstrations. And yet, there is another generation called Yushin generation. Um, this was after South Korean uh, government de uh, declared Yushin constitution whereby any remnant of democratic rule was completely wiped out. Uh, and so from this point on, South Korea was considered a frozen republic. And from 1970 to 1979, South Korea was basically ruled by emergency decree. And yet, you do see continuous demonstration by especially university students, factory workers, and uh, ordinary uh, citizens. Now, 1979, with the death of the dictator Park Chung-hee, you have what is known as Spring Seoul in South Korea, whereby there is a, a brief moment where people are coming out to street to celebrate the finally ar ar arrival of the democratic moment. And yet this is again crushed by the emergence of the new military headed by yet another general named Chun Du Hwan. And it is his declaration of martial law and closing of all the universities, dissolving legislature, banning political parties that led to nationwide demonstrations. So what happened in Gwangju was not necessarily unique in the sense that you do have South Korean citizens demanding, again, political reform and democratization. What, what was different in the case of Gwangju is this brutal attack by the paramilitary troops that were deployed from the DMZ area. Uh, and so the moment when the university students and ordinary citizens gather their forces together uh, to protest against not only the, um, the, the political repression, but also the crackdown of the paramilitary troops, that is the beginning of what is known as the Gwangju People's Uprising. So again, very, very quickly, here you have the scene of, again, ordinary citizens uh, participating in the demonstration, and, and which was met by brutal 
attack, indiscriminate attack by the paramilitary troops, um, which is again another reason why you have ordinary citizens beginning to arm themselves uh, from day four. Um, again, the confrontation between the troops and the citizens, and this is one of the iconic moments of the Gwangju People's Uprising where bus drivers and taxi drivers are joining ordinary citizens. Um, and from day five, the citizens managed to push out the paratroopers to the outskirts of the city. And from this day, from day five of the Gwangju Uprising to day 10, uh, you do have what one scholar called the absolute community where people in the city of Gwangju come together uh, and form basically their own government. Um, and reportedly there is no case of looting, robbery. During this time period, citizens are providing food, uh, order, and all this time the government and the broadcasting companies are reporting that all of this is instigated by the North Korean agents and that many of these people who are participating in the demonstrations are so-called impure elements. Um, again, some of the scenes, this is the provincial building, the, in front of the provincial building where thousands and thousands of citizens gather uh, on a daily basis. Um, and on the final day, all the telephones are cut off the paratroopers are moving in in the dawn of the crack, and then many of the people who remain in the provincial building are basically killed. And by 5 o'clock in the morning, the mop up operation was over. And these are some of the scenes. Um, and obviously, the official figures that are shown here is much, much lower than what the people of Gwangju claimed. And in some ways, the Gwangju uprising is the moment when South Korean democratization movement as a whole is beginning to question the role of the United States uh, militarily and politically. And from this point on, you begin to see what may be characterized as anti-Americanism in the South Korean democratic movement. And you also begin to see the South Korean democratic movement characterizing itself as a revolutionary movement. Uh, as to what the meaning of that might be, obviously, the whole decade of the 1980s is consumed with the debate as to what that means uh, for the participants of the movement, for the future of Korea, et cetera, et cetera. These are the burial sites of those who are killed. And this is the scene of the occupation of the USIS building by South Korean university students in 1985. Uh, which is an event that, again, um, sort of expressed for the first time publicly the South Koreans questioning the role of the United States government in the uh, suppression of the Gwangju uprising. Another characterization that comes out of this experience with the Gwangju is this notion that you, the, the, the youth people, or the, the, the participants of the democratization movement would have to be really serious about changing South Korean society in a more fundamental way. And one way of achieving that is to align oneself with the laborers, with the workers. And so you have thousands and thousands of university students and intellectuals foregoing their future as a middle class uh, because at this time, if you had university education, your life as a middle class was more or less guaranteed. Obviously, things are very different now. And so you have these students giving up their university education and diploma and going into factories uh, to organize <laughs> workers. And many of the prominent South Korean intellect, uh, 
politicians now uh, who are running for president, presidency actually happen to come out of that experience. Uh, one in particular, the candidate from Justice Party was a student um, and then decided to give up her university education and went into factories and she was involved in this one particular case in 1985, uh, for example, in the famous uh, Daewoo uh, industrial complex uh, uh, struggle. Um, and, and in some ways, the whole deca decade of the 1980s was about, again, finding the truth of Gwangju. Um, and so uh, you have series of events that led to what is known as the June uprising of 1987, where you do have uh, the transition taking place from military authoritarianism to parliamentary democracy. Uh, so some of the photos from the 1987 June uprising uh, that began in January of that year and that lasted until uh, June 29th of 1987. We're talking about large numbers of people, including ordinary citizens, monks, uh, and obviously university students. Um, again, some of the scenes from the June uprising. And so, I guess what I wanted to tell you to conclude my presentation is that there are still, obviously, various efforts to relive what is known as the spirit of May 18th. And at the same time, um, there is also what I call institutionalization of the Gwangju uprising or Gwangju spirit. And, and, and in some ways, it's a government effort to delimit, um, in some ways, the spirit of, of Gwangju. Um, uh, but uh, perhaps we can talk about the, 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 the specifics of it um, during the discussion uh, sessions. Thank you very much. Wonderful start to our conference. Uh, for those of us who know Mongolia or China can't help but be evoking thoughts in our minds about to the extent to which the Korean experience is followed through. Uh, an uprising that appears to be a failure but which clearly set the scene for things to come. And uh, we're going to turn next to uh, China and to Terry Wright, one of our most distinguished students of the student movement in China and in Taiwan, where she's also done comparisons. And now we can start to see whether what happened in 1989 set the scene for what followed or not. Sure, how I would answer that question. Hello, everyone. First, I just want to say thank you to all of you for coming here today, and a special thank you to the Institute of East Asian Studies for putting this event on and inviting me to join in it, and Dr. O'Brien and Caverly Carey for all their hard work in making this happen, and the government of Mongolia for generously supporting the event. And I have to say also that Berkeley is my alma mater. This is where I got my PhD, and I need to recognize Dr. Lowell Dittmer in the back, who was on my dissertation committee many years ago here at Cal. My dissertation was a comparison of the student movement in 1989 in China and another student movement that's less well known that occurred in Taiwan in 1990. And that later became a book. It's listed, I think, in the program if you're interested in checking that out. That project focused mostly on the process that occurred during those two demonstrations and I'm more than happy to talk about that more in the Q&A period today if anybody's interested. But since Dr. He and I are both talking about Tiananmen Square, I thought it might be useful for me today to focus more on the factors that contributed to the rise of political contentiousness on the part of Chinese university students in the 1990s, and then to compare and even contrast that with the situation in China from the early 1990s to the present, where we've seen a notable lack of political contentiousness on the part of Chinese university students. And then finally to comment on you know, some sort of future projections or speculations about China. 
So if we go back to the 1980s in China, what stands out is that relations between college educated students and the state were increasingly strained, increasingly distant. And in fact, at times, like in 1989, flared into outright confrontation. In fact, in the spring of 1989, as we all well remember, it appeared that China's university students might be the vanguard of liberal democratic change, which later they were in Mongolia and some other places. More generally, from around 1978 through 1989, students in China showed great admiration for the West, including its politics, its political system, philosophical ideas, and even mass media outlets. In contrast, college-educated young people in China in the 1980s showed disdain for China's communist and pre-communist characteristics and very little evidence, uh, sorry, very little interest in joining the Chinese Communist Party. We've seen a real change from the early 1990s through the present. During this period of time, college students have exhibited a much more positive view of the Communist Party-led political system in China and a much more negative view of the West, including the West's liberal democratic governments and mass media outlets. In fact, when college students in China have taken to the streets since 1990, they have not pressed for political liberalization. Instead, they have defended China and the Chinese government against foreign and domestic detractors. At the same time, though, university students in China from the 1990s through the present have decried Chinese government censorship, especially that of the internet, also have decried political corruption in China. And they have expressed belief in many of the ideals of liberal democracy. So what I want to do next is to look a little bit at the factors that have contributed to these changes, but also continuities in the political attitudes and behavior of Chinese university students. The most important factors that I want to touch on today, and I'll only be able to do so briefly, are first, the demographic characteristics of Chinese university population, student population. Second, the degree of unity within the top Chinese Communist Party leadership. Third, the content conveyed in domestic media coverage and China's educational system, including access to the internet. And finally, China's global economic and political status. So I want to take a little snapshot of these factors, comparing them in the 1980s with those in the 19, from the 1990s through the present. In the 1980s, university education was only available to a tiny percentage of young people in China. It was very much an elite, uh, very small sector of Chinese society. These students also felt sort of a historical duty to remonstrate the government, to call on it, to serve the people, etc. At the same time, Chinese university students in the 1980s did not have any special economic status. By and large, they were still assigned jobs by the government at the time. Also in the 1980s, university education was free. So you didn't have to have money in order to get a university education. Second factor in the 1980s, this was coming out of still the Cultural Revolution period in China. Many university students had a disdain for communism, but also China's pre-communist features. Many saw both of these as giving China a low economic and political status internationally and they viewed the so-called Western model as a sort of vehicle toward China's modernization. Third factor, during the 1980s there were clear divisions within the top ranks of the Chinese Communist Party, especially the second and third tiers of the party below the party elders led by Deng Xiaoping. There was a more pro-reform faction, which was led by one-time Communist Party General Secretary Hu Yaobang and Premier Zhao Ziyang, both of whom had been placed in their positions initially by Deng Xiaoping. 
the more conservative, or in Chinese parlance, leftist faction within the second tier of the Chinese Communist Party leadership was led by Li Peng. Students in China's universities felt supported by, and also supported, political leaders like Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang. In fact, it was the death of Hu Yaobang that sparked the student protests of 1989. He had also voiced support for earlier student protests in 1987, and as a result of that, he had been removed from the party's top post. In 1989, during the student protests, Zhao Ziyang actually visited the students at the square and reportedly wept telling them that he had come too late, that the decision had already been made on high to suppress the demonstrations. So a divided political elite with a sense among university students that there were people among the top ranks of the Communist Party who supported their cause. And then finally, in the 1980s, there was a relative relaxation of political education in China. The media was becoming more free during this period. And then finally, there really wasn't any internet available in China back then. It's hard for some of our younger folks to remember those days, but even when I was in graduate school, the internet wasn't really available. So let's now shift to the 1990s to the present. First major difference is that there has been remarkable unity among top Chinese Communist Party leaders, especially when it comes to politics or the question of political reform. The answer has been little to none. There's been great agreement. So there hasn't been an opportunity for university students to feel that they might have a supporter within the top ranks of the Communist Party. Second big change, college access has opened up dramatically from the early 1990s to the present. It's much more easy to get into a university in China today. A far greater percentage of the young population is able to go to college. At the same time, though, higher education has been, to a large extent, privatized, meaning you have to pay to go to college. It's become much more like the situation in the United States, in fact. For many young people, the expense is so high that it's simply not affordable. As a result of that, most college students in China today come from relatively wealthy urban families, and it's those same families that have benefited from Chinese Communist Party rule. So that's made them less likely to, you might say, bite the hand that has fed their families. Now, from the 1990s through the present, college students in China have exhibited an increased interest in joining the Communist Party, but it's not because they believe in socialism, it's not because they believe in whatever the party really stands for, it's because they have an instrumental or utilitarian view of Communist Party membership. With so many college-educated people in China today, and without being assigned a government job, you're really on your own in order to find a good job. And if you can show that you're a Communist Party member, then that will improve your chances of getting a good job. Next, economic growth since the early 1990s has increased China's international status dramatically. China now has the second largest economy in the world, and it will probably grow even larger than that of the United States in coming years. And this has fueled a great pride in China and the Chinese system as a whole, and a perception not that the Chinese so-called model is broken, but to the contrary, that the Chinese model works, perhaps even better than the American system. And if you want to talk in the Q&A period about recent perceptions since the election of Donald Trump, in the US, we can talk about that as well. Finally, starting in the early 1990s, there has been a push toward what is called patriotic education in China, an emphasis on pride in China, and an emphasis on the historical humiliation and abuse of China at the hands of Western countries. Since 
2012, but also prior to that time as well, there also have been increasing restrictions on the media. So the media has become less free, especially since 2012. The internet has appeared and is now used by millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people in China on a daily basis. And it is used to sort of out political corruption, usually of the local variety. But at the same time, the internet has not been used to call for street protests calling for political reform. In fact, when the internet has been used by university students from the 1990s through the present to facilitate any kind of street protest, those protests have been more nationalistic in nature and not calling for domestic political change. All right, I want to close with some reflections on continuities between the two periods and sort of speculation about the future. One clear continuity in the political attitudes of Chinese university students all the way from the late 1970s through the present is that they have consistently been vocal critics of political corruption. That has not changed. They also have been vocal supporters of freedom of expression. So that's a line of continuity that runs through the present. In terms of the future, as I mentioned before, most Chinese university students have a sort of instrumental or utilitarian view of Chinese Communist Party membership, but I would say that that extends to their broader support of the Chinese Communist Party-led system. In a word, utilitarian support can be fragile. And in the current atmosphere, really since Xi Jinping took the helm of the Chinese Communist Party, Repression of freedom of expression, the media, journalists, human rights lawyers, etc., has increased dramatically. And in this kind of situation, I would conjecture that the Chinese Communist Party is playing a sort of dangerous game and that its efforts to restrict freedom of expression might actually backfire and lead to a situation where students may again become more politically oppositional. Okay, stop. So we, his history uh, does throw curves of all sorts. Okay, so we've heard a story now about uh, student activism in other parts of uh, Asia uh, around the same time, some of it leading to fairly clear consequences, some of it, as I think Professor He and Professor Wright would agree, still leading to relatively unclear consequences, what it's going to mean. Now we uh, get to the main event, to talk about Mongolian democracy and, and the Mongolian uh, student movement and its consequences. And I remember that a moderator has very, very few tasks but one of them is to learn how to pronounce the names of the people who are coming up. And I did not do that prior to this. Uh, so I will uh, welcome uh, our professor of political science from the University of British Columbia. And can you please pronounce your own name so I don't do, I don't do something truly horrifying to it. So I do have, uh, have my personal memories, like uh, in nine, oh, eight, events in 1989 and 1990. In 1989, I was a high school graduate and just wondering around what's happening around this protest and demonstration. And, and next year, then I became a cadet at the military academy. We were, at a certain point, prepared to assist the police if they were overwhelmed by the demonst demonstrators. So I tried to disconnect my personal memories on this research and looking at kind of big structural issues either parties, and neither a supporter or nor a member of the parties. And this presentation is based on my field work done in Mongolia in 2015 and 2016. So unlike, unlike like China, Tiananmen, or South Korea, the Mongolia is kind of case you really need to look at in a kind of larger context. And this is a map. And if you're living in the 1980s in, in North America, it's kind of like a little bit scary and threatening map. So this is like a communist bloc map in, of 1980s. And you all know like where Mongolia is, right? So Mongolia is in the middle of this uh, communist bloc. And by 90, late 80s, Mongolia hit by this uh, third wave of democratization, as Samuel Hampton coined it. And we can divide these communist bloc countries into two categories, depending on how they responded to this uh, widespread protest. So on the European bloc side, 
Some of them resigned, some of them negotiated, and ended up in the first multi-party elections in the 90s. Albania, Albania is 91. And they kind of moved toward to the United States and, and United States on that. But on non-European cases, they done something very different. They're preserved, they're oppressed, they're preemptively suppressed, and become very strong, resilient communist states. And even though Vietnam, Laos, North Korea, to a certain extent, they have very contentious relations with Beijing, but somehow they overcame that contention and expressed their ideological sympathy and solidarity and kind of like swearing against the, the anti-foreign forces. Then it comes into the question why Mongolia is similar to European countries and why it's different from non-European countries. I'm going to get lay out a few arguments, but I couldn't go into fully detail in explaining them. So my first argument is the European cases in Mongolia were affected by the same external force, external fact, that's the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union normalizes its relation with the, with the United States and Western Europe. That kind of removed the external threat for the European states. The Soviet Union normalized its relation with China, that removed external threat from Mongolia. At a certain point, Moscow involved in removing the Brezhnev area leaders. And starting from in 1984, that was in Mongolia. And my second argument is the, the Communist Party is one of the kind of highest institutionalized political organizations. But in non European cases, they were run or dominated by the revolutionary leaders. Still, there were still in civil wars, insurgencies, and secession movements. But on the European cases in Mongolia, were run by the bureaucrats. They're not the hardcore revolutionary leaders. And then we can make it, I observe that there's a three key idiosyncrasy with the Mongolia. So weapon of the week or the opposition was hunger strike. There were two major hunger strikes which, which very effectively reached its objectives. And response of the rulers were compromised. Even though they were ready and prepositioned the forces to impose the martial law, but they choose to compromise. And then we see like there's this very strange thing. Like, there's a Mongolia really empowered the legislature from the very start. That's a, the people's great world was empowered. So those are kind of three arguments I'm going to go around. So the external, let me just explain a little bit of external factors. So in the 80s, Mongolia was a militarized state. By that, I mean all male under 20, age of 25 needs to serve, need to serve in the military three years, mandatory. And you need to remain in the active in the reserve force until age of 45. You cannot deny any tasks and assignments. And all the people, including the high school students, were kind of assigned some type of civil defense tasks. So in that case, when you have an external threat or internal threat, it's very easy for the rulers to impose the control in the, on the society. They can marginalize the opposition, they can penalize it, or they can even purge you with the identification of the, or connection with the external threat. So in nine, and then Mongolia, there was about 90,000 Soviet military were stationed, so the number is like there's a difference a lot, but there were about 90,000 Soviet military were stationed in Mongolia, and also about 80,000 Mongolian military, including all types of security organizations you can think of in the communist state. So the Soviets was trying to normalize this relation from early 80s. And one of the conditions imposed by China was removal of the Soviet military from Mongolia. And in order to remove the Soviets in Mongolia, the Soviets need to remove uh, Tidambal. Tidambal ruled in power in Mongolia from 1952 till 1984. And he, was, he, has very strong, he had a very strong anti-Chinese stance. That was very helpful for, him, for the Soviets in the 60s to extend very large military and political presence into Mongolia. But and also he had this type of illness, suffering from illness, illness called like a type of dementia. And because of this illness, his spouse and others trying to like meddle into politics. So that was a kind of like a reason for them to, for garbage to remove Tsitenbal. So it, the Tsitenbal is kind of considered the first Brazilian where a leader removed by garbage in 1984. And Mongolia, there was a very strong demonstration effect from of prehistoric and glasses in Mongolia. And Batman, who is a successor of Tsidambal, really basically endorsed the, those reforms in 1986. So when we put like in a bigger comparative perspectives, you will see like a Mongolian and the European cases, the external threat were removed, or at the stage of the removing. But on non-European cases, the, the United States was still considered as a hostile force, 
for Cuba, for China, and Vietnam and Laos. And then revolutionary leaders were still in power in non-European communist states. And interestingly, the non-European communist states were not so much controlled by Moscow. And that means that they're less integrated. But in the opposite, the, the Soviet states, like, uh, excluding Albania and it's some, uh, Albania and Yugoslavia, they were controlled by Soviets and they were very closely integrated politically, economically, and culturally with the Soviet Union. And this is like a very interesting photo of Gorbachev in 1981 in Mongolia. And I bet he was not conspiring with Batmung removing Sidumbal in 1984 or launching the reforms in 1985, 86. But he was a, the senior representative of the Soviet Communist Party attending in the Mongolian Communist Party's con Congress. Now let me like, just go like uh, the internal dynamics. I'm kind of like, missing lots of things. I'm just trying to like, simplify this. And but there's lots of things happening during this period of time. So 85, we start seeing some of the type of relaxation, relaxation of the ideological control. Party meetings, plenums, and Congress. There are some sort of critical discussions that has been occurring. Nobody had been purged at that time. And there is a, some interesting things happening. I just brought, brought like, three examples. So Time and Youth is like a very interesting TV program. It started in March 1986. This is a platform for the youth to engage in kind of critical discussions with the, with the leaders uh, on the, the politics, economy, and even historical matters. And then there was a very interesting and very influential article or op-ed was published in September 1987. And it's very known, well known to many Mongolians. And we there was a lot of records of like a, the emergence of the political debate clubs in starting from 87. And many of my interviewers have been pointing out the triggering event or critical juncture was the December 88, the fifth plenum of the Central Committee. Many people were expecting the Batmunk is going to remove the old and highly criticized the Politburo members, but he didn't. He instead introduced a strategy of the political economic reform and in his thinking, he was thinking like a, instead of like a going over the personal issues, but he wants to have a broader understanding and approval on the strategy. But it didn't really match the expectation of the popular opinion. And there's another triggering event happened in June 89. So the Communist Party approved to organize the second national symposium of young artists. It brought about 200 young artists from all over Mongolia and kind of provided them a, a platform to critically enga engage in artists' work, but it kind of expanded beyond the, beyond the goal. And we will start seeing the demonstrations. So, Ertnet on, on December 3rd, Ertnet is one of the, the second largest city in Mongolia, home for the, the Soviet and Mongolian copper factory. There were 60 workers made a peaceful march on December 3rd. And some of the interviewers are still like they were also planned earlier, but it didn't happen earlier for some reasons. Interestingly, in Yurtnet, there was also the first labor strike, but 400 truck drivers also made a strike in Yurtnet. And then we, on December 7th, the, about 200 faculty members and students marched peacefully, but they called for the collective resignation of the Politburo and Central Committee members. And Hobd is kind of like a, there's a big university in Hobd, and this is kind of center, educational center for the Western provinces. And then December 10th, the Ulaanbaatar demonstration started. So this is one of the well-covered demonstration in, in the West. So you will see within this short period of time, number of big demonstrations and movements and parties being declared. So you will see like a very quick institutionalization of the opposition. And the, the internal dynamics that there was a two important hunger strikes happened. Like the, the March 3rd is well covered in the West, so which resulted in the resignation of the collective resignation of the Politburo members and separation of the party, Communist Party, from the state institutions, basically from the legislature and government bureaucracy. But there was another hunger strike happened in Hoop School. The new leaders in April, they imposed, a, they kind of passed a new decree called 86 degree. Decree. So by that decree, any protest or demonstration need to get approval in advance. And if they didn't follow that, then they will be kind of, kind of penalized. But the protesters in Hoop School done it and they arrested and they staged hunger strike. 
And this gave very strong bargaining power for the opposition forces, and it, which ended the, the revoca revocation of the 86th degree and also kind of resolved and agreed on the revision of the constitution, which resulted in the mul first multi-party election in Mongolia. <laughs> So I'm like a simply like a over, oversimplifying all these events. I'm missing lots of other facts here. So this is a photo of the first hunger strike. It's a, it's a March, frigid cold in Siberian type of weather. And here's the Batmunk. He was a kind of soft liner, and he declared the collective resignation of the Politburo members. On uh, that ends the the hunger strike. And this is the sec second hunger strike happening in Hubskut province. So my kind of findings is okay, that the removal of the external threat in Mongolia, because with China, was very important opening up this or giving the breathing space for the domestic politics. And that resulted in removing the hardliners, as we call in literature. So Tsitimbal and Flato, like, so we, that resulted in removing the hardliners. And the party was dumb, we began to be dominated by hardliners or softliners, non-revolutionary leaders. But Munk was a was a status of faculty at the Mongolian State University, and he had the party bureaucratic uh, assignments. And the Ida's increase was hunger strike. There was twice, two major hunger strikes, both resulted effectively, and compromise, even though the rulers had the ability to suppress and impose the martial laws, they decided to compromise. And then empowerment of legislature was critically important. The Communist Party kind of stepped out from the legislature and, and provide their, all the rights, empowerment to the legislature. So this is a kind of one question I'm still like struggling with, and why not repress? So there was a number of theories like people throwing out when I was in Mongolia. So the one was like a fear of the international isolation, which is, has, there are lots of evidences on that. And then fear of the instability is kind of looking from the small state perspective. If the small state cannot handle its own order, then somebody will come and do it for you. So that's going to kind of, if you can't handle it, then that's going to welcome the intervention. And then concern with legacy, like a, he doesn't want to leave the legacy of the bloody uh, repression, or the concern of youth. And when you look at the age-wise, the rulers were in the 50s and 60s, and youth were in 20s and 30s. So you will see like a, this 30 years of gap between these two forces. So. I will end here and well, thank you so much for uh, giving us some background uh, for those of us who are not as familiar with the Mongolian uprising as, as maybe we should be. And I think the most daunting thing you did is not being a PhD candidate surrounded by professors. Uh, it's being an academic talking about the causes of something when we have people in the room who were there. Uh, for those of us who study protest, this is an occupational hazard that you actually can find protesters who often are quite ready and entirely correct in pointing out that our particular perspective on something uh, maybe is slightly askew. So we will find out how well your story holds up as the rest of the afternoon proceeds.